What's happening, guys and girls? Akronator here, and welcome to the official start of the Week of Madness for 2016. We're going to start off this week with another episode of World of Warcraft Dungeon Overview, and today we'll be taking a look at the current largest dungeon in the game with a whopping 19 bosses, Blackrock Depths. I'm going to be running through it with my Feral Druid here, and with that being said, let's dive straight into it. During the War of the Three Hammers, the Bronzebeard, Wildhammer, and Dark Iron Dwarf clans went at it for their stake to the throne of the recently deceased Modimus Anvilmar. After a long and bloody battle all across Chasmodan, the Bronzebeards emerged victorious, leaving their estranged cousins to their own devices. The Wildhammers retreated up north to Grim Batal, and the Dark Irons settled underneath Black Rock Mountain and their city of Tharasan. The Wildhammers were willing to let the past go and live out their existence separate from the hills of Dunmoreau. The Dark Irons, however, just couldn't let bygones be bygones. Tharasan's forces, led by him and his sorceress wife Modgud, led a two-pronged attack against Ironforge and Grim Batal. The assault failed, and the Dark Irons were forced to retreat all the way back through Red Ridge to their home city. With Bronzebeard and Wildhammer forces bearing down on them, Tharasan called out to the spirits of the mountain for something, anything, to help them out in this most desperate hour. Not just any spirit of Black Rock Mountain was summoned, but THE spirit of Ragnaros himself. The Fire Lord rained hellfire down onto the dwarves, and Tharasan's assailants retreated from the carnage that reshaped the land of Red Ridge into the Burning Steps and the Searing Gorge. Sorcerer Thane Tharasan was killed in the blast of Ragnaros' initial summoning, but many of the Dark Irons did survive the event, and were soon after enslaved by the Elemental Lord. Generations have now gone by, and Emperor Dagran Tharasan, descendant of the Sorcerer Thane, now leads his people under the Molten rule of the Fire Lord. He leads alongside his bride, Princess Myra of the Bronzebeard clan, though it's uncertain whether Tharasan manipulated her mind or she became infatuated of her own accord. Either way, King Magni Bronzebeard of Ironforge has ordered all able-bodied adventurers of the Alliance to dredge into the Dark Iron City and retrieve his daughter at all costs. What's more is that Ragnaros' forces have hooked up with their ancient allies, the Twilight's Hammer Cult, which can never be a good thing. While in Tharasan, you're also tasked with assisting Morgan's militia in bringing the walls crumbling down around the Fire Lord and his allies. Blackrock Depths is a very large dungeon, the largest in the game in fact, that spans all throughout the caverns underneath Blackrock Mountain. The dungeon has been split up into two different wings since Cataclysm for dungeon finder purposes, but the instance in its entirety is a level 42 to 61 dungeon located in the depths of Blackrock Mountain. For those of you who don't know where that is, go either to the Searing Gorge or the Burning Steps and look on the horizon for the mountain that blocks out the sun. You really can't miss it. There are two different ways that you can enter the mountain in order to make your way into the Blackrock Rock Depths. Both lead to the same place, but it depends on what level you are and where you happen to be questing in terms of entering from the north or the south. I'll be entering from the north, which means I'll enter from the Searing Gorge, which also happens to be the lower leveling zone attached to Black Rock Mountain. If you are in the Burning Steps, just head towards the largest mountain in your vision, which should be in the northwest corner of that area. For the Searing Gorge entrance, which you see here, it's in the southwestern corner. From there, make your way to the middle island held up by large chains dangling in the center of the room, and begin walking down the one path you're given. Once you're finished making your way down the mini spiral, you'll have to walk along a chain in order to make it to what looks like a small dwarven structure poking out of the wall. To be sure, there should also be an NPC standing inside a room straight ahead after getting off the chain that usually offers to teleport you inside the molten core. There will be a doorway to the right just before the NPC which leads you down another long hallway into more dwarven structures. This is where it's pretty hard to describe with words where you'll have to go. Fortunately, the world map actually becomes useful at this point, so if you're having trouble, try referencing that. I wouldn't doubt that you'll have to fight a few mobs coming up to the entrance, though it is possible to avoid them entirely if you're really good at sneaking around. Some of the mobs are rather strong, so it might be a good idea to enter with your entire group to fight off any aggro taken before the dungeon itself. Gerstan is one of the Twilight Hammer's finest interrogators, and she takes immense pride in her position. She relishes in the suffering of others, and equates the screams of her victims to that of the sweetest symphonies. Well, you know what they say, love what you do and you never work a day in your life. The only thing that you'll really have to watch out for is Gerstan's mana burn ability. This will steal a whole lot of mana from one unlucky player, which can really screw things up if it manages to target the healer. Be sure to interrupt this once she starts casting it. The healers kinda need their mana to keep you alive and all. Justice in the Dark Iron Clan is met with a very unique method. The accused is forced to fight for their lives in an arena against some of the most vicious creatures Black Rock Mountain hosts. If they're capable of surviving, the accused can walk out scot-free. No one has survived to date. 
This fight will initiate once every party member steps inside the arena, and then High Justice Grimstone will summon two waves of some random mob. Once the waves of trash are taken out, Grimstone will summon a boss mob for the group to fight. None of these are noteworthy, and they should go down relatively fast, so pretty much just another tank and spank. Rockor is a rare occurrence among fire elementals, as he hates the backstabbing and scheming that goes on within his people's ranks. In order to escape from all the hate and jealousy, he purposely pissed off the Fire Lord so that he would be banished to Blackrock Depths. I guess that answers the age-old question of if dwarves or fire elementals make for better company. Rockor will cast Ground Tremor every so often, which will stun all players within 20 yards for 2 seconds, so spellcasters, step back. He will also cast Earth Shock on random players whenever they begin spellcasting, so take note if you notice your spells not taking. Grebmar Fleabears, yes, that is his real name, was an orphan that took to breeding bloodhounds when he was young. His pack are of the highest quality all throughout Tharasan, and he's tasked with patrolling the city with the bulk of his family during work hours. You're going to want to take out the hounds surrounding Grebmar as soon as the fight starts, because he can cast Bloodlust on them randomly, increasing their haste dramatically. Other than that, Grebmar will begin to run away when he has 15% remaining health. Guess you could say he has his tail between his legs? Eh? I'm not sorry. Near the edge of the Dark Iron City lays a massive road with two gates at each end. One way leads to the rest of the city, which you'll actually pass through later on, while Baelgar has been tasked by Ragnaros himself to guard the gate towards the outskirts of the highway. It's rumored that only the highest ranking of Ragnaros' forces know what's behind Baelgar's gate, and one thing is certain, this molten giant isn't spilling the beans anytime soon. Baelgar will afflict anyone who melee attacks him with Magma Splash, which damages players with fire damage over time, and stacks up to three times. This means that the tank and any melee DPS should be the priority of healing for this fight. Minions of Baelgar will be randomly summoned throughout the fight, and these adds should be taken out as quickly as possible, since they have a nasty habit of ganging up on the tank. Incendius is a pupil of Baron Geddon himself, and he trained under the Baron until he showed a bit too much promise. Worried that the student would one day surpass the master, Geddon had to devise a plan to rid himself of Incendius, but the Fire Lord wouldn't approve of letting such talent go to waste. Incendius was sent to Blackrock Depths to guard the legendary Black Anvil. If any of you out there are blacksmiths, you'll likely know how significant this job is. There's only a few things to note about this fight, and neither of them have much to do directly with the boss himself. The first is that it's very easy to fall off the edge of the boss room if you're not paying attention. If you do, there's not much your group will be able to do to help. You'll just have to die in the lava and run back to the entrance. The second note is an ability the boss has called Curse of the Elemental Lord, which increases fire damage taken significantly. Incendius usually casts this shortly before dying, so it's not so much him you'll have to worry about, but rather the mobs you'll fight shortly after. The effect lasts for a while, and it's very easy to forget about and die as a result of. If anyone in your group has dispels, I'd recommend using them here. Darkfire is the chief architect of the Dark Iron, and he earned his title by scheming and conniving his way to the top. He is both hated and feared for his prowess, not just as an architect, but in combat as well. Darkfire is a paladin, and shares many of his abilities with the player class. He can cast Holy Light, which heals himself or a nearby ally, though this can be interrupted. He can also use Seal of Reckoning, which heals himself or an ally every time they deal damage. This one isn't interruptible, it's just something that you should take note of if you notice the enemy's health is slowly going up over time. After many long years faithfully serving Emperor Tharasan, Stilgis was awarded the honor of guarding the Dark Iron Clan's coffers. As a gift to his good friend, Grebmar gave Stilgis one of his finest hounds to assist in warding off would-be thieves. Stilgis is a frost mage, which means he'll chill any melee attackers who hit him. He'll also put up a ward against others' frost damage, so fellow frost mages, beware. The real annoyance for this fight will be Stilgis' hound, Varric. Varric can cast Curse of Blood on a random player, increasing the damage they take from all sources. On top of that, it'll enrage once it hits 25% health. I can't believe I'm saying this, but it's probably a good idea to take out the boss first, then worry about the mutt.
Lorgrain is a former shaman of the Earthen Ring before he left to join the Twilight Hammer. It came as a complete shock to those who knew him, as Lorgrain's reasons for joining the Cult of the Old Gods are still a mystery. All that we do know is that he's the enemy, and that he's had this coming for a long while. Lorgrain will summon a Scorching Totem, which will attack nearby players with fireballs. This should be taken out as quickly as possible to avoid unnecessary damage. It should also be noted that Lorgrain, as the name would suggest, takes less damage from fire-based sources. General Angerforge is one of the highest ranking officers in Tharasan's army, and is considered to be a tactical genius. What he is not quite as proficient in, however, is politics. Soon after being promoted to general, Angerforge wrote a not-so-eloquent letter to the Emperor, summarizing the clan's past military failures and what he would have done differently. As you can imagine, Tharasan was not pleased. To get him out of his hair, the Emperor sent Angerforge to the opposite side of the city, where he could still command his troops without pestering anyone else about battles past. Though he's one step short of being cast out of the city, Angerforge is still a dark iron through and through, and would die for his people. For those of you who are trying to make your way to Angerforge and the pathway is blocked, go back down the hallway to the east garrison and pull the lever that reads Shadowforge Lock. It'll close the gate that you originally passed through to get to Lord Incendius, but you shouldn't need that pathway to advance any further. Angerforge is surrounded by four trash mobs, which don't do much individually. It's just that they can become overwhelming if they're left alive for the tank to sponge up all the damage. What's more is that the general will summon even more trash mobs once he reaches 40% health. Well, he is a general, the old you and what aren't me argument doesn't really work against him. Argomac is an enchanter who spent his entire life with golems in order to unlock the secrets to immortality. He's become the foremost master of his craft as a result of his obsession with eternal life. There's even rumors floating around the city that he has found a way to transfer his spirit into his golems after his body is destroyed. We'll see about that. The only significant thing for this fight is that Argomac will have two of his golems to fight alongside him. You know, after that lore bit, I was hoping that he would actually have transferred his soul into them to prolong the fight a bit more. I guess eternal life is too much to ask for from a dwarf. Ribley is a goblin inventor who usually gets himself into trouble with whatever mechanical failure he manages to concoct. His most recent product, Chewable Gunpowder, has earned him a place on Booty Bay's most wanted list, courtesy of Baron Revelgaz himself. In order to avoid those who would want to cash in on his bounty, Ribley retreated to the Grim Guzzler, where everyone is hammered 24-7. Good plan. Ribley is surrounded by three of his cronies, which of course means that they'll have to be taken out before the boss can be focused on. At 30% health, Ribley will attempt to get the hell out of Dodge and run away like the little wimp he really is. I mean, come on, who the hell brings bodyguards to a bar? Hurley is one of the more regular patrons to the Grim Guzzler, and he's usually smashed out of his mind. The only time he left the bar for an extended period of time was to wander off and steal a recipe for the Thunderbrew's Lager, of which Hurley touts of its strength. In order to initiate this fight, you must destroy the three Thunderbrew kegs found off to the corner room of the Grim Guzzler. Once they're gone, Hurley and three of his pals will rush in to initiate the fight. It should go without saying at this point that the trash mob should be taken care of first. Hurley will occasionally cast Flame Breath, which damages players standing in a cone in front of him, so melee DPS should stand behind him at all times. This massive stone golem is a creation of the Grim Guzzler's owner, Spazring, which he created to prevent any more brawls from happening. It's worked well enough so far. In order to start this fight, you'll need to buy all 10 Dark Iron Ale mugs from Spazring and complete the repeatable quest for the nearby friendly NPC called Private Rocknot five times. From there, Rocknot will begin causing a bit of a ruckus, violently burst open a keg of ale, and cause Phalanx to go from friendly to aggro. Unfortunately, the most interesting thing about this fight is initiating it, since it's really just a simple tank and spank. Oh well, at least pissing off a giant robot is mildly entertaining. This leper gnome found a place to call home when he established the Grim Guzzler after the fall of Nomergum. Sure, he's dabbled a bit in the arts of being a warlock, but who in the right mind hasn't? And besides, it's provided the bar with the best waiting staff anyone could have asked for. 
It may appear as though there's no way to actually fight Spazring at first, but trust me when I say there is. The simplest and easiest way is to walk up to him and attack him like you would any of the other patrons in the bar. In this case, just be warned that there are about 5 trash mobs standing in the immediate vicinity of the boss, and about 10 more nearby, so don't kite too much. The second and much more trolly way is for a rogue to attempt to pickpocket Spazring, to which you will call out to all the patrons of the bar to turn aggro to you. I wouldn't recommend this, but you know damn well that some rogue is going to go out and try this now, and to you I say, please record this, I kind of want to see it happen. As for abilities, Spazring is mostly just a generic warlock, with one unique ability called the Curse of Tongues. This allows for the affected to speak in demonic language for a short time, and also reduces their casting speed significantly for 15 seconds. Flamelash has been appointed by Ragnaros himself as the ambassador to the Dark Iron Clan. Though he initially despised the dwarves as lesser beings, he's grown to respect their knack for utter destruction of everything that stands in their path. As a sign of his camaraderie, Flamelash now guards the chamber where the Dark Irons enchant the vast majority of the weapons for their armory. The one thing to keep in mind for this fight is that seven little fire elementals will spawn on the seven runes located around the edges of the room, and they will begin to move toward the boss. If they're allowed to make it to him, they'll buff Flame Lash with an increase in size and damage that can stack up to 50 times. On a somewhat related note, he looks pretty funny when this buff is maxed out. Just look at him, he's freaking huge. These seven ancient Dark Iron Sorcerers were with Sorcerer Thane Thorison when he originally summoned Ragnaros into Azeroth. Though they perished along with their leader, their spirits have been restless as a result of their horrible failure to save their people. On an unrelated note, I'm like 95% sure that these bosses are supposed to be an easter egg referring to the seven dwarves from Snow White. To start this encounter, you'll have to talk to the Doom Rail NPC located at the far end of the room from the entrance. Once that's done, the bosses will start to come at you one at a time. That's really all there is to this fight, since the most difficult part about this is finding which dwarf is attacking next. Ambassador Flamelash appointed Magmus as a personal guard to Emperor Dagran Thorison in order to quell the Dark Iron leader's fear of assassins, but this did little to help. Because apparently, having beings of living fire wasn't enough for the Emperor, so he needed to give this molten giant the ability to control fire-breathing statues as well. I'd love to hear the conversation with the architect for the city. Yeah, I really like all the doom and gloom you've added to the place, but it's missing something. I've got it. Fire-breathing statues! No more questions? I am the Emperor! This is probably the most complex fight for the entire dungeon, so listen up. At first, you're going to enter a room with a shit ton of Dark Iron Dwarves patrolling around. What you need to do is kill the Shadow Forge Flamekeeper mobs, namely two of them. You can tell them apart from the rest of the mobs in the room because they're the only ones wearing orange armor, and everyone else is wearing black. Make sure that your party members loot the torches that these mobs drop. This much is vitally important. Once you have the two torches in hand, make your way to the back of the room where the two pedestal things are. You'll know what I'm talking about when you see the fire elementals guarding them. Kill the surrounding mobs and have one of the torch holders in your party light the brazier. Then you need to head over to the other brazier and light it, and once that's done, the doors to Magmus will open up and you can get the hell out of Dodge. One of the biggest things for the pre-boss room is that you keep on moving. The mobs in this room will keep respawning after a short amount of time, and I'm sure that you don't want to get gangbanged by a bunch of dwarves. The only thing that's avoidable for fighting Magnus himself is the fire coming from the statues. Try your best to kite the boss out of the fire, since it will kill you if you stay in it for too long. Ruling the Dark Iron Kingdom alongside his wife Princess Myra of the Bronzebeard Clan, Dagran has been working relentlessly as of late to please his elemental master. A curse that his ancestor set upon him, the Emperor truly wants the best for his people, even if that means protecting them from Ragnaros' wrath by serving the embodiment of fire. Dagran uses mostly fire-type attacks, none of which are avoidable or significant in any way. What is interesting is that since Cataclysm, Princess Myra has been replaced in this fight by a mob called the High Priestess of Tharasan. She shares all the same abilities as the current Dark Iron representative, but is much less significant in the lore. The High Priestess has two different heals and can cast Mind Blast like player priests, so she should definitely be taken out before the Emperor is downed. I know that this fight and this dungeon especially have been long and painful, but it's all going to be worth it. I mean, you get to take a selfie in this sick-ass chair. You see? It's all about priorities.
Well, I hope you all enjoyed this episode, and if you did, feel free to give it a thumbs up. And if you want to see more like it, maybe even subscribe. I'd really appreciate it. Links for my social media and whatnot are in the description below. And as for the comment question, we talked a bit about the romance between Myra and Dagger and Thorisan, but what I didn't mention is that we later learn outside of the dungeon that Myra wasn't mind-controlled. She truly loved Dagran for showing her the love and attention she never got from her father, Magni, and she eventually gave birth to her son, Fenran Thorisan, who's currently found with Myra in Ironforge's throne room. So, I'd like to know, what's your favorite romance in the Warcraft universe? For me, it's a tough one, but I've always loved the way the novel Beyond the Dark Portal depicted the relationship between Illyria Windrunner and Turalyon. Anyways, that's all the time I've got for today. I will see you all tomorrow for the final episode of the Borderlands Let's Play, so until then, don't die.